The title of my talk is Strong Cost Censorship versus Lambda. So we already heard a little bit about strong cost censorship uh, in, in particular in, in the first talk of this workshop uh, of Jonathan Luke. Um, and strong cost censorship is really uh, related to, uh, at least in the context of this talk, of the fate of um, observers like the poor fellow we see here falling into black holes. And this talk is really about um, what, what happens to the status of this conjecture uh, when it faces the challenge of lambda of the cosmological constant. So, um, so if we go, so let me very quickly review the geometry of Schwarzschild and Kerr. It's basically the comparison between these two geometries that gives rise to the conjecture in, in the first place. And then I'll review the, the basic formulations of, of strong cosmological censorship. Um, so some of this has already been touched upon in, in the talk of, of, of Jonathan. I'll review the underlying mechanism that in some sense uh, determines the fate of various formulations of this conjecture, namely the issue of blue shift versus dispersion. Um, so I'll explain uh, this issue uh, later on. And finally, uh, I'll, I'll turn to the sort of topic of this um, talk proper, namely what happens when strong cosmic censorship uh, meets cosmological. Okay, so, um, so off we go. Um, so let me just very, very uh, briefly review the pertinent facts of the geometry of Schwarzschild and Kerr that give rise to the issue. So this is Schwarzschild, uh, as we all know. And uh, one thing we know about Schwarzschild is that singularity article zero is space-like. So actually this piece of text is taken from this very prophetic paper of, uh, of J.L. Singh from 1950. In fact, this is the first paper that studied the maximum extension of Schwarzschild. But also, to my knowledge, it is the first paper that refers to a singularity as being space. And well, um, if there are any historians of general relativity in, in, in the audience, I'd be interested to know if there is sort of a, a, an, earlier, um, an earlier paper, uh, for instance, in the context of cosmology. But anyway, so the singularity article zero is space-like. Um, but uh, here's another phrase, again, from this very prophetic uh, paper of, of Singh, uh, just because you have a singularity doesn't mean that you cannot uh, uh, ask the following question. Is it conceivable that a test particle should travel through the singularity? And in fact, Singh thought that the, the answer was, was yes, but in some sense, uh, we can now in a very definitive, in a very definitive way say that the answer is no. That observers falling into the black hole are eventually torn apart by tidal uh, deformation, so there is no sense that a test particle could, could ever travel right through this. And actually, this, this is something that was really first discussed, at least to my knowledge, uh, in uh, section 32.6 of uh, Misner, Throne, and Newton. So, um, so actually, there's a, there's a sort of a dual way of uh, trying to characterize how strong, so this is really a statement of the strength of the short to singularity. So there's a dual way of characterizing it without actually introducing uh, observers as sort of stick figures like, like is done in um, in the section of, of, of gravitation. Um, so, well, I guess here is the observer who's being destroyed, by the way. Um, but the dual way uh, is just to think about inextendability problems of the metric. And in fact, you can sort of characterize the strength of the Schwarzschild singularity by the following statement that the metric is inextendable beyond article zero, not only as a, as a twice differentiable continuously metric, but just as a continuous directional metric. Mm -hmm. And this uh, actual sort of characterization, which seems very fundamental, is actually very recent and it's due to that. Okay, so Schwarzschild, space-like singularity, C0 in extent. Okay, now let's turn to Kerr. So from the point of view of uh, the Cauchy problem, the maximum future Cauchy development of uh, Kerr initial data uh, is incomplete. Here it is, this is the picture, but it is smoothly inextendable. It is smoothly extendable, sorry, beyond a bifurcated Cauchy horizon. Okay, and of course, this famous concept is due to Stephen Hawking. Um, and in fact, it's a, it's a particularly pernicious sort of such example because all incomplete geodesics in, in the maximal Cauchy development, they can pass into the extension. So here is uh, such an observer along such an incomplete uh, geodesic up, he passed into the extension. So, um, so of course, um, a similar uh, phenomenon, as all of you know, occurs in the rice nordstrom solution of the electrovacuum equations, which I may also refer to at certain points. And the uh, upshot of all this is that, as, as applied to Kerr, the statement of Penrose's celebrated incompleteness theorem uh, is not due to singularity formation, but rather because of loss of uniqueness, that's to say, failure of determinants. So, 
Um, so at first thought, you might think that uh, this is a much more favorable situation than Schwarzschild. Certainly, it's much more favorable for, for this observer over here who survives, as opposed to getting um, torn to pieces by infinite tidal deformations. But for the theory, uh, this uh, situation is in fact more pathological and, um, um, and more worrisome. So uh, strong cosmic censorship, which we'll pass to next, is basically a way out of this dilemma. And this was the ingenious way out of this uh, dilemma conjectured by, by Penrose. So uh, based on the conjecture, uh, which goes back to 1973, is that the kirk oshi horizon is just a fluid. And for generic asymptotically flat initial data, uh, the maximum future Cauchy development is, is inextendable. So you cannot extend the solution beyond the, the Cauchy horizon. But of course, uh, when, when you say it's inextendable, you have to say inextendable as what? Okay. So, um, so well, the strongest possible formulation you might want to give uh, is what I'll call the C0 formulation. So that's when you say that it's, it's an extendable as a manifold with continuous Lorentzian metric. So this is exactly the formulation uh, which is true in the Schwarzschild case. And this would be a very attractive formulation because it would ensure that, you know, if, if you go to the boundary of space time and you're an observer, you would be destroyed by infinite type of conditions. So this would in fact be the most sort of um, attractive uh, resolution of this problem of determinants in current. So, so that's great, but there's a little problem with this. Um, uh, there's a little problem with this conjecture as I formulated, which is the following. So let me first remind you of, a, of another uh, conjecture, which I, I think we'll hear more about. Uh, we already heard more about, and we'll hear more about later in, in this um, uh, workshop, uh, the stability of the Kerr exterior. So as, um, as has been discussed already, uh, the Kerr exterior is conjectured to be stable as a solution to the full Einstein vacuum equations without any symmetry. So small perturbations of, let's say, two-ended current initial data lead to a maximum future Cauchy development, complete null infinity with a regular event horizon, and such that in the exterior, in particular along the event horizon, the induced geometry approaches inverse polynomially to two nearby solutions. So, um, so let me not say anything more about uh, this uh, sort of um, open problem other than to say that it's, um, it's not very contentious. That's to say, everyone believes that this is true, and in fact, there's a very good sense of why it's true. So let's believe this conjecture. Um, so uh, a few years ago, uh, Jonathan, Luke, and, and I proved the following uh, theorem, that if, if this conjecture is true, uh, then actually the Penrose diagram of, of Kerr is, is globally stable. And moreover, the, the metric extends um, beyond the uh, kerr cauchy horizon, at least continuous. Okay? So in particular, uh, uh, in these perturbed space lines, you still have these observers, which are not destroyed by infinite tidal deformations, and they can arrive at and cross a, a Cauchy horizon. So a, a corollary, of course, of the statement is that if, if Kerr is indeed stable in the exterior, as sort of we have a very good sense of why that's, uh, that's true, uh, then the C0 formulation of strong cosmic ascension is actually false. So, um, so back to the drawing board, let's reformulate a strong cosmic censorship. Um, so how, how could one, con what kind of conjecture could one make that might still be true? Well, the next best thing is a, what I'll call the crystal tunnel formulation. So this is the statement that, uh, well, um, maybe it's, it's not inextendable as a, as a C0 Lorentzian metric, but if we throw in the condition that the Christoffel symbols be locally square integrable, then it's an extendable. So, um, so it turns out, uh, for reasons that maybe I'll discuss later, that this statement is compatible with the proof of the previous theorem. In fact, it's, it's suggested in some sense by the proof. Of the previous theorem. Um, so in particular, we, in our theorem with, with, with Jonathan, we certainly do not prove that the Christoffel symbols are, are, are well-behaved in the sheet horizon. But the motivation for this conjecture is that uh, this has a very definite fiscal interpretation. It tells you that uh, the metric is breaking down as a weak solution of the Einstein equation. So it's sort of uh, a much stronger statement, for instance, than the statement that you know, curvature is going on. It's, it's really saying that there's no way, at least no obvious way, to interpret uh, the uh, metric as a, as a weak solution of the Einstein equation at, uh, at the Cauchy-Pierce. So in that sense, you can think that this restores 
determinism, there's really only one object that one can re reasonably call the solution to the equations of motion arising from initial delta j. So that's somehow the motivation behind uh, this formulation. Okay, so um, so that's the that's sort of the story with strong cosmic censorship and, and formulations coming from the asymptotic flat case. So let me tell you a little bit about the, the underlying mechanisms that sort of went into the picture in the asymptotic flat case, because the underlying mechanism is, is one of a, a competition, a competition between uh, blue shift and, and dispersion. So, um, so, okay. And this, this competition, I should say, can be understood at the linear level. Of course, one of the difficulties of the problem is once you understand what happens at the linear level, proving a nonlinear result like the theorem that I, I mentioned. But in some sense, what's, what's going on a posteriori can be well understood uh, at the level of linear analysis. So the level of linear analysis, here's a sort of a toy problem that, that, that sort of tells you what's going on. So let's fix curve once and for all, sub-extremal rotating curve. Uh, and let's just consider the scalar wave equation on the curve background arising from smooth localized initial data on some Cauchy hypersimple C. So, so, so the problem is to understand the global properties of, uh, of C, of the solution, in the black hole interior. So this is, of course, the darker shaded feature of this diagram, in particular, the behavior of the shaded And if you, if you sort of can understand this, and you know how to do nonlinear analysis, there's a, there's a translation between linear behavior and a sort of uh, expected conjecture. Of the OK. So, um, so why is this problem um, um, uh, sort of why would one expect in the first place to have instability? Why, in some sense, could Penrose conjecture what he conjectured in the first place concerning strong consumption? Well, it all goes back to the celebrated blue shift instability, which again was first uh, noticed by Penrose himself. So, what is the blue shift uh, instability? Again, this is very uh, familiar to uh, many people in the audience. So, Imagine you, you have two observers, so they're both depicted here. Um, so one of the observers is um, in the exterior. The other observer enters the black hole and at some later uh, proper time crosses the Cauchy horizon. And imagine that the first observer sends a signal uh, to the second observer at a, at a constant uh, rate as, as he or she uh, measures the signal. Okay? So here you see the the, the various signals. So they are going off at a constant rate because you have to remember that the proper time, the total proper time that the outside observer has to live is actually infinite. But, um, but since the proper time of the observer entering the black hole is finite, then uh, sort of as suggested by the picture, these uh, signals are arriving uh, more and more frequently. And in fact, the signal is infinitely shifted to the blue as uh, the observer crosses uh, the event horizon. So if you think about sort of this sort of signals as some you know, geometric optics approximation to waves, and you remember that, well, the Einstein vacuum equations, whatever they are, they linearize to, to a wave equation, then you might think that this generates some instability, instability for linear waves, which will then be seen uh, in the full nonlinear field. And in fact, in uh, sort of the original heuristics, there was a continuation of this argument which said that, well, Okay, and in, in linear theory, you expect some sort of bad behavior in the Cauchy horizon. That's the worst that can happen. Linear equations can never blow up sort of before the boundary of the maximal Cauchy development. But nonlinear equations can, and you might think naively that in full nonlinear theory, you have a singularity before there's a Cauchy horizon and thus a space. space. Okay, so that was sort of the, 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 the intuition. Okay. So, so what are the theorems that sort of resolve this question, first of all, at the linear level? Well, first of all, before understanding anything about the black hole interior, you have to understand uh, sufficiently well the black hole exterior. And in some sense, in this context, um, uh, there were sort of um, complete understanding in the full sub-extremal curve range in a theorem with Rodniansky and Schopenhauer and Rothman from several years ago now where we showed that for this smooth localized initial data uh, imposed on, on sigma, if you solve the wave equation on sub extreme curve, then indeed you have sufficiently fast inverse polynomial decay for the solution in the exterior region. Okay? So in particular, along the event horizon. Now, 
Um, and maybe I should say already that uh, many other people have uh, sort of contributed to, to, to this problem uh, along the way. And there's also some more recent results, which, which are actually important also, which I'll, I'll, I'll mention in just a second. Okay. So, um, so already, of course, this tells us that in some sense, this, this um, naive picture, which, um, which I uh, drew for you, isn't the whole story. Because, of course, um, already we see that there's a competition. You see, in, in, in this sort of picture that I drew with the, with the two observers, you know, observer, which is outside the black hole, is sending every second a signal, okay? And in, you know, the way I told you to think about it, that signal is of, of equal strength. But what, what this theorem tells you is that, well, perturbations don't actually work like that because, you know, perturbations of initial data in the exterior, they actually decay. Okay, they decay inverse polynomially in time. So when you go back to this naive picture, you, you really shouldn't be thinking of a, a signal going out at equal strength because anything, you know, if you want, you think of this as a naive uh, picture um, sort of associated actually to waves, then the, the waves going in are actually decaying as, as sort of the time uh, goes to infinity in the exit. So, uh, so actually, there is this decay, which in, in principle competes with 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 evolution. Okay. So um, so um, so nonetheless, the theorem is that uh, in this competition, the blue shift wins. Okay. And so there are various formulations of this theorem due to various uh, people, uh, including all the people that are uh, listed here. But the final statement that you can make is the following: Consider appropriate notions of generic, and the right notion of generic differs in, in all these relevant theorems, but um, let me skip that detail. Generic smooth localized initial data um, on, for the wave equation on either subextreme occur or also nice or Nordstrom, uh, then the local energy of C blows up at the Cauchy horizon, okay? So local energy just means in, if you go to local coordinates, um, the, um, the integral of, um, the sort of energy located, um, measured by a local observer, which would be um, the first derivatives of C uh, in L2, okay? So that quantity blows up at the position. Okay, so, um, so here for, 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 for um, these results, it's important in some sense to have a lower bound on the, the rate of decay in the exterior because decay in the exterior is competing with the blue shift. So you need to know that the decay is not too fast. So you need generic lower bounds. And well, sufficient generic lower bounds to obtain this theorem were, were, were obtained by the, the people sort of uh, listed here, but actually there's some more recent results which are even better as far as lower bounds are concerned by Angelopoulos, Aretajis, and Gaich, and, and Hintz, which could also be used in, in applying this theorem. Okay. So, um, so, uh, so this is the theorem. And um, uh, on the other hand, um, so maybe more, more surprisingly, uh, sort of when, when this was first really um, uh, noticed, uh, even though the, the local energy does indeed generically blow up, um, the amplitude of the waves does not. Okay? So this is a theorem of um, uh, Anne Franzen and actually okay, so the first uh, theorem of this type, uh, which made various symmetry assumptions, et cetera, uh, is, is in fact due to a, a student of Penrose McNamara. But in any case, so the, the theorem says that in, in the context we're talking about, either extremal, uh, sub extremal rhizomosome occur, then solutions of the wave equation arising from sort of smooth localized initial data, they um, remain bounded in the black hole interior. And in fact, they extend continuously uh, to the bifurcate Cauchy collapse. So if you want, our uh, results with Jonathan on the full nonlinear stability of the Kerr-Cauchy horizon is just, uh, a, you know, we promoted this linear theorem to a full um, nonlinear statement about the ancient type of equations. So, um, so let me summarize what, what just happened here so that it's, it's clear, uh, and then we can move on to the topic uh, proper of this talk, namely, Strong cosmic structure versus lambda. So, in the exterior region, we have polynomial decay of waves, 
in the interior, we have this blue shift, which in the right coordinates, you can think of as exponential growth of derivatives. And what's interesting is that the blue shift is sufficient to severely destroy derivatives. So the exponential growth wins over the polynomial decay in the suitable coordinates, but it is not strong enough to destroy the amplitude of C. Okay, that was Franzen's theorem. And that's why sort of at this coarse grained level, you have in fact stability and that stability carries over to the full level. Okay, that's the situation for, for lambda equals zero. Um, let's now try to understand how this problem changes when we introduce cosmological constant. So, um, so we all know that uh, the, the Kerr family has its cousins uh, when you add a cosmological constant of either side. These were worked out by Brandon Carter back in, in, in the 60s. And these are called Kerr de Sitter and Kerr anti de Sitter according to the sign of the, the cosmological constant. And well, the solutions are, 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 are given here. Um, so let me first talk about the, the positive cosmological constant case. Um, so in this context, uh, we have a, a very nice theorem, um, namely the, the theorem of Hinz and Vasi from a few years ago, which, which says that the region between the event and cosmological horizons of very slowly rotating Kurt Sider is in fact stable in the full nonlinear theory. And not only is it stable, but you actually have exponential decay along the event horizon. And this is very important, in fact, for the stability proof. So uh, in principle, our theorem can be applied actually also in the case of positive cosmological constant. Uh, it's actually uh, a little bit easier exactly because you have stronger decay assumptions that you can make about the event horizon. And um, you can apply our theorem to yield now the stability of the above Penrose diagram, at least uh, all this portion of the Penrose diagram. So the, the exterior region uh, is also worthy of attention. And there's some, um, there's some works of, of, of Schlu in trying to understand the, the, the stability of the, what's called the cosmological. But at least sort of this whole um, region of the Penrose diagram, uh, uh, you, can, you can show in principle is, is stable. And, uh, and again, you can falsify C0 formulation of strong cosmic samples. So in fact, it's, you know, it's even more false than it was in, in the uh, asymptotic flat case. Um, so that's great, but the interesting question here is now to understand what about the Stolulu formulation, okay? Because exactly because things are more stable, you might start worrying about the Stolulu formulation. So, um, so you see, uh, the reason being that, uh, as I just told you, we have uh, in the exterior region, we have exponential decay now. So one can think in the context of, of the linear wave equation, which as I said, is a good model to have in mind to understand this problem. Uh, you have exponential decay of C. And in fact, in some sense, uh, you can think that the asymptotics of C are governed by quasi-normal models, okay? at least in this smooth case that we're talking about. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in the interior, we have this blue shift, which as I said, you should think of as a mechanism which wants to cause exponential growth. And, and so now we really have exponential versus exponential. So it's really all about the rates. Okay. So, um, so actually I, I uh, sort of motivated by this just a little formulation, which was new at the time. Um, I, I looked at this um, uh, issue and uh, in, a, in a paper I wrote maybe seven, eight years ago, um, I made a conjecture that actually if the initial data in question, so this conjecture, the various um, formulations of it, um, both a nonlinear and a linear, so this, um, Nonlinear version of the conjecture I made in the context of the spherical symmetric model problem, where um, you actually had Reiser Nordstrom de Sitter in place of Kurt de Sitter, and you looked at the Einstein uh, scalar field system in place of the max in, in case of the uh, vacuum equations. But the conjecture was the following that if your initial data is sufficiently close to Reiser Nordstrom de Sitter with parameters sufficiently close to extremality, but still sub extremal, then there's a window, uh, and uh, in that window, the spacetime extensions uh, can uh, uh, can be chosen so that the, the extension uh, is um, is actually Lipschitz, okay? And the scalar field extends H1 log. So um, so 
in particular, uh, if, if, if you believe this conjecture, then Stothulu's formulation of strong cosmic censorship would not be true in lambda greater than zero. So again, there's sort of a, um, um, I should mention that sort of this spherically symmetric model problem has been studied in the meantime um, in the positive cosmological constant case by, uh, by a group in, in uh, Portugal. So Costa, Giral, Natario, and so um, So there's a linear version of, of this conjecture, which now uh, one can make in, in, in either the sort of sub-extreme or de Sitter case or, uh, or the um, Rice-Nordstrom de Sitter case. So the linear version of this conjecture uh, is that if you consider the linear wave equation on these backgrounds, if the parameters of the Kerr de Sitter or Rice and Nordstrom de Sitter are sufficiently close to extremality, then C extends H1 log across the Cauchy horizon. Okay, so this is the linear version of the failure of Christodoulou's formulation of strong cosmic censorship for lambda wave. So, okay, so. Um, so this, um, in more recent years, has had uh, lots of developments. So in particular, in the Reiser-Nordstrom Sitter case, uh, evidence has been provided in favor of the above uh, conjecture in a very nice paper, um, sort of numerical paper, but with some uh, actual analytic input um, due to Cardoso, Costa, uh, the Stunis, Hintz, and, uh, and Janssen. Um, on the other hand, uh, maybe even more surprisingly, in, in, in the Kerr case, uh, evidence has been provided for the failure of uh, the above conjecture. Uh, and this is a, a paper of uh, Oscar Diaz, uh, Felicity Eperon, Harvey Real, and George uh, Santos. Um, so um, so I'm, I'm, I, 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 won't, I won't talk about why sort of this, why you have this failure. I mean, what is fundamentally different in the Kurdish Sitter case. This is something that I had completely missed. Um, but let me focus for a second on this Rice and Nordstrom de Sitter case, where it seems that the conjecture was true. Um, so, so does this really mean that uh, uh, positive cosmological constant lambda has defeated the Christodoulou formulation of strong cosmic censorship, at least for the electrovacuum equations? Um, so this is something that troubled me because um, in some sense, we, we do want this formulation to be true. Um, and it turns out that there is a way out. There is a way of sort of uh, restoring the validity of strong cosmic censorship. If you're uh, willing to sort of make it yet another tweak to how you formulate the conjecture. So the point being the forward, if at the end of the day, you're making the conjecture in whatever regularity class, say the class of weak solutions of the Einstein equation, because you believe those are the fundamental that is the fundamental notion of solution, then you should certainly be willing to entertain the fact that the data should be generic in precisely that. And so a linear uh, version of this problem would be, instead of considering smooth initial data, you should consider initial data, which is precisely in the class that you want to show an extendability. So in particular, in this case, um, the, the, the class of H1 log cross L2. And what we showed with Jakob schlappentorf rosner is that for generic initial data in that class, then um, you have that the solution of the wave equation is an extendable H1 log. So it's an extendable in that class across the Shiko lines. And this is true in riser nordstrom de Sitter and Kurt de Sitter for the full sub-extreme so, um, so this suggests that if you want, Christoph Ludwig's formulation of strong censorship can be saved by enlarging the class of admissible initial data. And actually, we've seen in the nonlinear setting, sort of in Christoph Ludwig's sort of proofs of weak cosmic censorship, how useful it can be to enlarge the class of, of, of initial data. So in some sense, this is a thing which philosophically is similar. Um, and there's actually a more general uh, version of our theorem. So you tell me, the HS class for S greater than or equal to one, uh, in which you want to entertain solutions, so each HS class has a sort of a, a formulation, then you have the analogous statement. Generic initial data in that class leads to a solution which is inextendable across the Cauchy horizon in that class. Okay. So it really is the case that the, the, the solution at the Cauchy horizon is more singular than the initial. Data. So what, what, what has happened here? Um, so what has happened here is the following. If you consider rougher data 
then the exterior dispersion is no longer governed by quasi-normal modes. In fact, quasi-normal modes become irrelevant. And what it's governed by is a rate which is directly related to the redshift factor. And it so happens that there is a, just a geometric relation between the redshift factor and the blue shift factor, which is such that the blue shift factor always wins. Okay, so it, 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 it really reduces now to a competition between the blue shift and the redshift. And the, the blue shift happens to win by the, the, the geometry of these space lines. And it would be very nice to know if there's somehow a fundamental reason geometrically why the blue shift always wins here. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a fact. Okay. Um, and uh, this, uh, these ideas have been further uh, developed in, in uh, a very nice paper of Oscar Diaz, uh, Harvey Real, and George Santos, which um, uh, so they named this phenomena, you know, taking the rough with a smooth. Okay, so, um, so finally, let me talk about what, in some sense, I, I think is the most interesting case at all, uh, uh, of all, which is the case when you add a negative cosmological constant to the einstein right equations. So here, of course, the analog of, uh, of Kerr is um, the Kerr anti -dissim. So I'm only going to talk about the linear theory, so I'm only going to talk about linear analogs of this problem for now. And, um, and the point here is that um, we saw already that in the zero cosmological constant case, we have polynomial decay of waves in the exterior. In the positive cosmological constant case, we have the results of, of Hintz and Vasi and others giving exponential decay of waves in, in the exterior. Well, in the asymptotic ADS uh, case, in the case of Schwarzschild and Kerr and Rice and Nordstrom ADS, we have inverse logarithmic decay of waves in, in the exterior. So this is a, a, a theorem of whole cyclism. Let me see, of course, you should remember when we're discussing the problem of ADS, then it's not enough to uh, impose initial data. You also have to impose uh, boundary conditions and uh, the most uh, natural in some sense boundary conditions are reflective boundary conditions. So this result is, let's say for reflective boundary conditions at, uh, at, um, uh, at Scrum. So they showed logarithmic decay and they showed that this is sharp. That's to say that in, in Sobolev spaces, the generic solution will decay logarithmically and no better. And well, this is very, very ominous for the interior because um, you see all the methods of stability in the interior, the methods of showing that the amplitude remains continuous, they relied very, very heavily of having polynomial decay, in fact, polynomial decay, at least at a certain rate. So, so this theorem put into question even the prospect of amplitude uh, stability in the interior. So in some sense, this is a very attractive possibility. This means that possibly in, in the negative cosmological constant case, C could blow up in amplitude on the Cauchy horizon. And of course, if you remember the translation, C blowing up in amplitude is sort of like saying the metric itself blows up. So this would mean, this would suggest that at the nonlinear level, Maybe the, this original formulation of cosmic censorship, the, the better one, the C0 formulation, might actually be true. So in some sense, this is very attractive. You know, because of this worse behavior in the exterior, possibly strong cosmic censorship, a stronger version is true in the negative. So anyway, this was sort of the thought. Um, so let me summarize this again here, that uh, you, you have weak dispersive uh, effects in the exterior, just this logarithmic decay, you still have this exponential growth of derivatives in, in the interior, uh, which effect wins now for the amplitude of the state. Okay, so, um, so I thought that maybe C will generically just blow up. That in some sense would be nice from the point of view of strong cosmic censorship, but uh, at least in the Rice and Nordstrom anti Sitter case, uh, uh, Christoph Kehler, uh, uh, a few years ago, proved me completely wrong. So he, he showed that despite that hope, um, actually for the wave equation on um, riser nordstrom anti Sider, despite the slow decay, uh, solutions of the wave equation, they are still continuously extendable beyond the Cauchy horizon, just like in the lambda equals zero and the lambda equals zero. Um, so, um, Okay, so what I, what I thought might be true was not, was not true, but, but then came a very big uh, surprise. And the surprise is that 
Um, whereas so far in this problem, there's often been a close analogy between um, well, the Reiser Nordstrom and the Kerr case. Um, it turned out that there was finally a very big difference in this problem in, in the Kerr case. So, um, so Kayla later proved that if you look at the Kerr anti case, then there exists a set of black hole parameters, which is bare generic, and we'll get back to the origin of this uh, sort of notion later on, such that um, if your background black hole has these parameters, then the generic solution of the wave equation will blow up at the Cauchy horizon in amplitude. So if you want, this suggests that in, in this bare generic sense, uh, the C0 formulation, strong positive censorship, may, may be true after all. But um, together with this theorem comes a, a conjecture, which he also makes and is strongly uh, suggested by the proof, which is that if, if you look at the complement of that set of uh, black hole parameters, which is a Lebesgue generic set, so it's the set of measure one in a full measure in the, um, in the set of um, admissible sub extremal black hole parameters then uh, generic solutions of, uh, or all solutions of the wave equation for backgrounds uh, whose parameters live in that set uh, will, will be continuously extendable beyond the Cauchy points, just like in the lambda to zero and lambda to zero. So if, the, if you want in the Lebesgue generic uh, sense, it appears that the, the C0 formulation, strong cost may again be false. So, um, so what, what, what happened here? So what's interesting is in some sense, um, what's happening here is not uh, related in any obvious way to, um, to the blue shift. It's another phenomenon. So what's happening here is actually there's a resonance between the quasi-normal spectrum associated um, to the exterior and, uh, and a certain interior scattering pole associated to rotation. And somehow this scattering pole arose naturally from work of Kayla, previous work of Kayla and Schlappentorf Roth. So, um, so basically what happens is that if the black hole parameters satisfy a generalized non diophantine condition, then that uh, sparks this resonance and causes C to, to, to blow up. And, uh, and as one knows from such, um, so this is a number theoretical condition, of the sort of dimensionless versions of the parameters, um, that sort of defines a, a set of parameters which is generic in the so-called bare sense, but, but non-generic in the Lebesgue sense. So this is precisely reminiscent uh, of small divisor problems in, in celestial mechanics. So, so there's this very, very funny aspect that, that happens in this problem, only in the negative cosmological constant case that there's number theory. The number theory of the parameters is what determines uh, sort of the validity or not of the sort of the blow up associated to strong cosmic So, um, so this is very nicely summarized in the uh, end of pieces of, of, of Kayla, that small divisors and diophantine approximation, which are the, the villains of the problem of stability of the solar system, because in the context of the solar system, we want stability. Um, they may turn out to be the elusive cosmic sensor uh, which Penrose was searching for in order to protect the term in, in general. Because you see, in the context of this problem, instability is good. Instability is what makes strong cosmic censorship true. So, uh, so this is, a, as uh, Kayleigh writes, a vindication of Poincaré's faith uh, in instabilities caused by small divisors. So anyway, in, in summary, uh, strong cosmic censorship versus lambda, uh, the jury is very much uh, still out, but I think it's a fascinating uh, problem and there are many uh, open things to understand, uh, not least of which is uh, what happens to this picture uncovered uh, by, by these uh, results in the full nonlinear theory. Thank you.